Jenna Scott is gonna come now and read Psalm 23 for us as we continue in our series through Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Janice. And uh, let's read together aloud our prayer of illumination. I'll read the first part. Oh Lord, by this we know that we abide in you and you in us because you have given us of your spirit together. Abide with us as we worship you today and may your spirit illumine our hearts and minds that we might know and love you more deeply. Amen and amen. I'll give you a, a quick for fair warning here. Uh, I prepared this sermon this week on a couple of different days where I was battling a migraine. And uh, I find it funny, uh, not that I had a migraine, it's still kind of lingering this morning, but I find it a little funny that I was studying, though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death while I was battling a migraine, because I felt like I might be dying at one point. And uh, so, as a result, there's gonna be some things that I'll read that you would normally, I would normally have them on the screen, but you'll just hear. Uh, and then uh, there's other parts that in the nine o'clock, I just told a group, I said, we'll just see how this goes and we'll trust the Lord with it. Um, and it may or may not be the darkest sermon I've ever preached. So um, I say that jokingly, but you know, again, we'll see. Um, let me start with this. In one of my favorite places in the world to go, you, you, you if you've been around, you've heard me say this before, is, is to Colorado, to the Rocky Mountains. My family and I, we just love going out there. We've been out there numerous times over the years. And of course, one of our favorite things to do when we're out there is to make our way up to one of the peaks. And uh, I, I can't count how many times that we've stood at the top of the 11,000 or 12,000 or even a 14,000 foot peak there in the Rocky Mountains. And once you're up there, of course, the view is overwhelming. It's, it's glorious, it's, it's breathtaking, and it's, it's even at some level hard to take in. But one of the times I was up there last summer, something occurred to me. As we stood there and looked around, I just had the thought, no one lives up here. It's barren, it's above the tree line, it's cold, even or cool, even in the summer, strong breeze, winters are absolutely brutal, and uh, the second thought came to me, life is lived in the valley. You know, mountaintops are amazing, but they are not the rule, they are the exception. Mountaintops are incredible, but that's not where we do life. Life is more valley, way more valley than mountaintop. Now, some of that life done in the valley is not necessarily overwhelming, it's, it's fine, it's good, but it's certainly not the rush of a mountaintop. Maybe it's more ordinary, mundane. But then, even as we'll see in this passage, there are those times where the valley grows dark, ominous, overwhelming. Maybe we could sum it up by saying this. When we're talking about those kind of valleys, we just can simply say, you know what? A lot of life is hard. It is. We admit that to one another often. Even when we're going through hard, teams, uh, hard times, we'll say to one another, life is hard. Almost as a conciliatory comment to say, you know, I'm with you in this. I share in the hardened life realities with you. What happens with us a lot of times is that as, as the darkness creeps in on us in those deep valleys, 
we begin to either do one of two things. If we're not there yet, we've never had a deep valley darkness of, of darkness in our lives. We fear them greatly. We dread them. And if you're in it, we begin to be tempted to believe a couple of things. One, that God is not for us, or even a little more, unfortunately, that he's not even present, that he's not with us. You know, Psalm 23 tells us, just in six verses, uh, an incredible amount of overwhelming truth about who God is. And we've discovered some of those already. We've, we've looked at how he doesn't just lead us to green pastures. He is our green pasture. He doesn't just lead us to places of rest besides still waters to drink from. He is the fountain of living waters in whom we drink deeply. He isn't just one who takes us to things that will restore us. He is the very one who restores our soul as our shepherd. And he's not, he's not one who just leads us in paths of righteousness, the right path to go on. He is our very righteousness in whom we stand before God. We've, we've seen these truths about Jesus and they're beautiful. But if there's anything that Psalm 23 shouts to us, it's that he's with us. Psalm 23 wants us to see and to see abundantly that the presence of the Lord is our pervasive comfort. The presence of the Lord is our pervasive comfort. Let's read verse four again, which is where we are as we've progressed through this psalm the last few weeks. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Pause. Just in your mind, I want you to insert why. I will fear no evil. Why? Why will I fear no evil? For you are with me. You know, sometimes what happens with very familiar Bible verses is that even, even for, certainly true of us who have been in, in, in and around church for quite some time, but even for those who haven't, you've heard this so often that it loses its power and meaning. It becomes familiar to the point of mundaneness. But what we just read there, I will fear no evil for you are with me is one of the most profound truths that the Bible gives us. One of the most profound promises even that God tells us over and over and over again in the Bible. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. You do not need to be afraid. The presence of God throughout Scripture is our pervasive comfort. Let's walk through this, this verse, just bit by bit, as best we can in the time that we have. And we'll start with just that very first part. Though I walk through the valley. I've already mentioned that valley, life has lived in the valley. But what's true of a valley? There's certain valleys in our lives and there's certain valleys that exist in the world, literally, physically, uh, that are ominous. They're not exactly what we think of when we think of a valley. They are, uh, they are more treacherous than what life seems to be able to support. Uh, I love this little book by David Calhoun called A Sheep Remembers. Um, I'm gonna read from it, and I forgot to tell Lou Ann, who runs our bookstore, that I was gonna be doing this. I texted her this morning and said, hey, sorry, last minute, but I'm gonna be reading from this little book. Do we have any copies? Because typically when I reference a book from the stage and say it's great, which it is, many people go out that door to our bookstore and get a copy. The problem is she only has one. I don't know which one of you is gonna get it. I kinda wanna be out there to watch how the fight goes down, but... For those of you who can wait, she's gonna order more and you can get it next week or you can go on Amazon or any of those other places. But one of the things that Calhoun does in here is he, he actually quotes another author and, he's, and it's interesting, listen to this. A little bit of even um, uh, context to uh, the topography and the reality of life there in Israel when David wrote this and still true today. He says, there is an actual valley of the shadow of death just south of the Jerusalem Jericho Road, which, by the way, is the same road that Jesus is talking about when he gives the 
uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. It's in Palestine, and every shepherd knows of it. It is a very narrow defile through a mountain range where the water often foams and roars, torn by jagged rocks. The path plunges downward from about 2,700 feet above sea level at one end to nearly 400 feet below sea level at the other into a deep and narrow gorge of sheer precipices overhung by frowning sphinx-like battlements of rocks, which almost touch overhead. The valley is about five miles long, yet it is, listen to this, yet it is not more than 12 feet at the widest section of the base. The valley of flaming purple rocks is made perilous and dangerous not only through vicious animals that crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their covert and deadly snakes lurking among the rocks, but because of its furrowed floor, badly eroded by the floods and waters from the cloud bursts, the actual path on the solid rock is so narrow that in places the sheep can hardly turn around in case of danger. Perhaps David is thinking of that very spot just outside of Jerusalem on the journey to Jericho. Maybe that's what he's thinking of and he's giving the parallel, the analogy to his own heart and life that even though I walk, and, and David was a, sh a shepherd throughout Palestine, so perhaps he had led sheep right through and walked right through that very place and thought there are times in life that feel just like this. Now, there are other realities to valleys as well. Not all valleys are deep and narrow and jagged and overwhelming and ominous like that one. Sometimes we're in the valley, but like I said, it's, it's more just kind of, yeah, that's where we do life. Because listen to what's true of valleys. Sheep lead, uh, shepherds lead their sheep through valleys all the time, and it's in the valley where things are most dangerous, even though they have what they need. And a lot of times they're trying to lead their sheep through a valley to a higher place. Because in the summertime it gets so hot, they lead them to higher altitude to feed. It was interesting as I was reading, why would a shepherd lead sheep through a valley, even if it's filled with potential dangers? Here's why. First, it's the gentlest grade to get to the higher place. So it's the only way sometimes that you can get to those pastures that are higher up on the mountaintop. In other words, you have to go through the dangerous parts of the valley to get to the better place that the shepherd is leading. Secondly, what's true of valleys is that they are the most well-watered landscape. You know, last week we, we talk about, or two weeks ago, we talk about that it's the place where, you know, uh, he leads us beside still waters to drink deeply of him, the fountain of living water. Well, where does that happen? It's not on the mountaintops, it's in the valleys. And then similarly, it's where the richest and greenest grass grows. It's where they feed the best, it's where they drink the best, and it's the best way in which to get to where the shepherd ultimately is trying to get them. You hear that and you go, wow, David has been thinking about the valley the whole psalm. As he's been talking about the green pastures, as he's been talking about the clean waters and the places of rest, he's actually thinking about this is where we do life. We do life in this fallen world and this reality. We do life in the valleys. And that is the very place where we most readily experience God to be those things for us. But there are those unique valleys that he leads us into that are more like the wilderness that he led Israel into. You ever think about how confused Israel was? You ever noticed how angry, disgruntled they were? God led them out of a lush place, although they were slaves in Egypt. They had plenty to eat, at least in their minds they did. And he rescues them by the hand and literally the staff of Moses as a shepherd figure. And he leads them out and he leads them into the wilderness where there is no water, where there is no pasture. And there are those times in life where the valleys that we do life in become those jagged, barren, seemingly fruitless and in malnourishing spots of the earth that become spots in our hearts that become the realities of life. 
He describes it in this text as though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now that, that phrase that we translate shadow of death is one Hebrew word that like a lot of times, we say this a lot as pastors, not to say, hey, look, we've done the word study, you should be impressed, but just so that you understand that there's a lot of times that in the Hebrew and in the Greek, the two languages that the Bible is written in, that there are many times that there is a word that is so rich in its original language that we have many ways to describe it in the English language. And this is one of those words. And we often translate it shadow of death, but it's really more all-encompassing than that. In other words, it's not just when we're about to die that David's referring to here. It's not just when the shadows of death are all around us and we can begin to see the end in front of us. It's, it's really the, the more uh, specific nature to defin the definition or to define that Hebrew word is deep darkness which expands the view of that word now to say that it's not just when I'm approaching death, it's any point in time in life when I'm overwhelmed with the darkness of the world around me or even in me. It's when I'm in the dark night of the soul. It's when I feel that oppression and that pain and that fear and it is absolutely overwhelming and that could be way before, obviously, I'm on the precipice of death. Certainly includes that, absolutely. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Just this year, just in 2022, some of us right here in this room or listening online or watching in one of our other venues, we, just this year, many of us have received news, have, have heard a sentence that immediately cast us into the valley of deep, of deep darkness. Some of us have heard those dreaded words, you have cancer. Some of us have dealt with the unexpected death of a loved one, or maybe even an expected death, because it's not like it makes it that much easier. We've heard sentences like, your child is not going to make it. We've experienced the dark night of the soul of depression that just won't lift, of anxiety that is completely crippling. We've experienced the, the seemingly just nonstop, uh, relentless issues of pain physically. Even this week as I prepared, I thought, I wonder how many people suffer constantly from migraines. It's part of life. It's a part of living life in these valleys. There's infertility and pregnancy loss. There's loneliness there's all kinds of things. The list goes on and on and on. And here's the question. Here's the question that may be on the tip of your tongue. If not, it's certainly on the tip of your heart. Which is, why does God do that? Why does a good shepherd lead his sheep through valleys of deep darkness? Let me be honest and say uh, any, any person who has followed God for any time can honestly say that there are many times in life where we just simply answer, I don't know. I don't know. He's good. He's trustworthy. But I, I, I'm not real sure exactly what he's doing and why he's leading us here, leading me here. One other thing I'll say, and then I want to give you three reasons that are certainly not all encompass, don't, don't encompass all the reasons why he would lead us into deep valleys of darkness. But I'll give you three in just a moment. Before I do, I want to just say this. There's a phrase that we use often. It's a good phrase. It's, it's, it's fine. I'm not, I'm not saying don't use it. But sometimes when we're walking into something difficult, we will say to one another, hey, you know, God was not surprised by this. And that's true. He, he certainly wasn't surprised by it. But it leaves a connotation that I don't always love. Because I think what we, and it, it, you know, gosh, there's, there's a time and a place to say what I'm about to say. But what we need to say at some point to one another to help us see that God is so far beyond us, we need to be able to help each other see that not only was he not surprised by this, whatever it is, 
He purposed it. He ordained it. We don't serve a God who sovereignly rules and reigns over everything and holds each hair of our head in place and every dew drop on the blade of grass and every rain from the sky and every cloud which way it's to go and every planet in orbit and every star in the sky that he knows by name. We don't serve a God who is that powerful, who, who at some level when hard things come, he's hands off the wheel God. And he's so big and he's so amazing and he's so infinite in his wisdom and he's so beyond us in his thoughts and in his purposes that if we knew what he knew and if we saw what he sees and if we had the wisdom that he possesses, we would say a hundred out of a hundred times, I would pick the very same thing for me. The problem is we can't see it. We're not wise like he's wise. We're finite, not infinite. We can't see the breadth of eternity the way that he can. All we can see is what's right in front of us, and what's right in front of us is hard, and it's dark, and it's overwhelming, and it causes us to cry out, why? And please know that David is right there with you. If you read through the Psalms, many of which Dave wrote, Dave, it's just Dave now. <laughs> He wouldn't mind. He wouldn't mind. He would. <laughs> Dave. Oh, good old Dave. King Dave. Wow. <laughs> I guess I got to go with Dave now. The ones that Dave wrote. He's right there with us. He's wrestling. So many of the Psalms are struggles of his heart. It's him, it's him crying out to God, why have you forsaken me? Have you forgotten me? How long, O oh Lord, will you be silent? He feels it. It's part of life. It's actually part of walking through the valleys of deep darkness. Let me give you just three things briefly here of why God does it. Why is our shepherd, does he lead us through these valleys? First, it's, it's where we hear the voice of the Lord most loudly. Many of you have heard this quote many times, but uh, it is so very good. From C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, he says, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain, it is, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. He speaks so very loudly in our pain. Some of you may be hearing that and going, okay, yes, I get that and I've experienced that, but I'm sick of the pain and I've heard him enough. It's gone on far too long. What in the world could he be up to? And it's hard to hear that sometimes we won't know what he's up to until we're in glory with him. Until we're able to see him in all of his splendor and majesty and with that reality also begin to see the, uh, the spread of his purposes more fully than we ever have. And again, we will say, oh God, if I had only known you were so good, you were so good. He leads us through dark valleys because it's where we see the character of God most clearly, where our eyes are open to see who he is. And, and I would add to this, it's where we see him most clearly, but it's also where he makes us most like him. It's where he does incredible deep level of the heart surgery on us because he has our ear. And he has our attention and the distractions of the world and the idols of the heart that we typically run to in times of ease and comfort and pleasure are not in the picture anymore. And our pain has allowed us to laser focus on him to see his character more clearly. Christian, we, we, have, 
We have to get it through our minds. And we have to sink deep into uh, the, the, the waters of our hearts, the reality that we cannot, we cannot use our circumstances as the lens through which we define the character of God. We can't. Because where we will land if we do that, we will land in all kinds of unhelpful and even harmful conclusions about who he is that the scripture does not present to us. We cannot use our circumstances, whether it be good or bad, as the lens through which we define the character of God. We use the word. We use the scriptures. And we impart those to one another to remind one another. And we read and we saturate our hearts and our minds in the truth of God's holy and inerrant and infallible word that reminds us that regardless of my circumstances, God is who he is. And he can be trusted even when I feel like he is not with me or for me. Third reason that God leads us through dark valleys is because it's in those places where we draw near to the shepherd most readily. You remember the valley that was described in Calhoun's book that, that, that does exist right there outside of Jerusalem? At the very bottom where the path is, it is so narrow that the sheep can't even turn around. And it's in the valleys where sheep are so fearful where the shepherd has to make sure they know that his presence is with them. He'll reach down oftentimes as he leads his sheep through these narrow paths. He'll reach down and just touch them just to let them know, hey, shepherd. The shepherd is here. He'll, he'll take his staff, the long end of his staff, and he'll just, he'll just gently touch, touch their side to let them know, hey, the shepherd is here. As we walk through this horrific landscape, I am with you. I've led you here. I will lead you through it, and I'm not leaving you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Let's talk about that for just a minute. The shadow of death. Because the world would say, hey, this is all good and fine, but you're still going to die. You, you know, death still has the final word. And, and ultimately, is death not what we're fearing the most? You know, all of our fears come to a, a point with death. It's, it's all the fears of, of bad health and this and that, whatever it may be, is ultimately pointing to the greatest of all fears, the greatest of all enemies that we have, which is death. Yet, David here says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. But what do we have that David didn't even have? David knew that there was one coming who would be the presence of God with us. David knew that there was a Holy Spirit coming who would indwell all believers. Maybe he didn't know that, but he expected something grand was coming. And who are we now? We are people on the other side of the cross of the Good Shepherd. We are the people on the other side of the empty tomb of the Good Shepherd who came not just to lead us through the dark valleys, but to obliterate the consequences of the dark valleys, which is death itself. To take the very enemy of darkness, the very, the, the very uh, penalty of darkness, the very enemy of our greatest fears, and to say, I have conquered it. So that Paul, when he's writing the Corinthians, would even sing a little song, where, O oh, death, is your victory, where, O oh, death, is your sting. You cannot mock me anymore. I don't care about your shadows anymore. You can lead me all you want to that dark place, but in the end, I know I rise with Christ and death has no power over me. I will fear no evil because who is with me? Jesus, the one who conquered the grave, is with me. I don't have to fear. That's what Psalm 23 is screaming at us when you look at the whole of Scripture. This is what David is saying when he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen, the greatest comfort that the Scripture offers to God's people is his presence. Watch this. I mean, just a quick flyover. He said to Jacob, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. He said to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. 
He said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you go, okay, well, those are just to the leaders of Israel. What about all the people? Well, here we go. He said to Israel, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not consume you. And you say, okay, well, that's Old Testament. What about new? Well, let's go to the very last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. We remember what people say last. And what did Jesus say? Surely I'm with you always. Even to the very end of the age. This is what Dave, Dave, again, my goodness, David. I have a dear friend whose name is Dave. I'm gonna blame him for this. This is what, it's what David was wrestling with in Psalm 139. Wrestling in a good way. He says this, he says, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And he continues and he says, if I go even into the, out into the middle of the sea, the loneliest place in the world, you're there. And he says, and even if I'm consumed with darkness, darkness is light to you, oh God. You are there. There is nowhere I can go. There is no circumstance I can be in. There is nothing that I could experience, no pain that I could have where Jesus, as the good shepherd, with his staff, is not sitting right beside me, touching, reminding, caressing. Remember last, year, uh, last week, holding us, steadying us, caring for us, and saying, I am with you. John 14, Jesus is teaching the disciples, and he says, I've, I've got to go. And they go, why are you leaving? He says, I have to, because if I don't go, then the helper, also known as the comforter, will not come. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When you believe upon Jesus by faith as your Lord and Savior, immediately you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We don't have a staff tapping our shoulder. We don't have the hand of the shepherd reminding us. We have the shepherd living within us. The presence of the Lord is our pervasive comfort. For the sake of time, I'll, I'll be very quick on the, next la the very last part of this, this verse. He says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Real quick, when you hear rod, I want you to think the word of God. Because here was the function of a rod. For the shepherd, it was, a, it was a function of power and authority to remind the sheep that he was in control. It was also an, a vessel of discipline to discipline them when they were going off path, which reminds us that God's discipline is actually a measure of his comfort. It was to examine and count the sheep. Uh, Ezekiel 20, 37 says that God is going to have Israel pass under the rod. It's just a way of saying, I'm gonna examine you and I'm gonna cleanse you. The shepherd would take that rod and he would comb through the thick wool and he would be looking for things. He'd be looking for parasites and different bugs and he'd be looking for irritations on the skin and if he saw anything, he would fix it. He examines his sheep. He cleanses us. Lastly, was a measure of protection, to protect from the wild beasts, from the bears, from the wolves. A shepherd was insanely good with his rod against those who would come after the sheep. You think about the word of God. This is, this is what the word of God is for us. Our power and our authority, our discipline, it examines us, it cleanses us, it protects us. When you think of the staff, I want you to think of the spirit of God that we just talked about. The, the role of the staff, is there anything more iconic to a shepherd than the staff? Curved at one end, straight at the other, and what was the purpose of the staff? Three things in particular, to draw the sheep together, to, to reach out and take a wayward sheep and pull him back into the fold. It was to guide the sheep, as I've already mentioned, the straight end of the staff, to take the end of it and just put on the shoulder and guide back to where they should be going if they're going off the path. Lastly, to rescue. 
The hooked end of the staff was to oftentimes be used is to pull a sheep that has gotten him, gotten him or herself into a, a precarious situation, to pull out of the water, to pull off of a cliff. Is this not who the Holy Spirit is for us? The one who guides us, the one who leads us, the one who rescues us, the one who draws us to him and to the herd. I'll close with this. Many of you have, may remember me uh, a couple years ago sharing about some dear friends that we have in, in Birmingham, um, Hugh and Morgan Cheek. I had the great honor to be able to lead Hugh to faith in the Lord when he was a student at the University of Georgia when I was on staff there with crew. Was able to officiate their wedding and soon thereafter, celebrate when they welcome twins into the world. They found out within the first year of those twins' lives that they had been born with a very rare genetic disorder and that their time on earth was very short. Hugh and Morgan are in their mid-30s and they've buried two daughters. Their faith... And what they write inspires me to love Jesus more. Just a couple of weeks ago on, on Morgan's Instagram account, she wrote this. She had posted a video and she gave a disclaimer, said, hey, you may not wanna watch this, it's hard to watch, but it was of her second daughter. Her first had already gone to be with the Lord of her just a few days before she passed and she was writhing in pain. And she wrote this underneath that video. She said, why? Why so much suffering with so little respite? Lord, you say, let the little children come to me why do so many of them, so many of us, walk such treacherous paths to get there? This morning I sat with the question, who do you say I am? That's the question that Jesus asked his disciples. I thought about my experience of Jesus in the darkest valleys of evil and death. I can authentically say he has been the following, steadfast, non-judgmental at every turn, non-explanatory for his ways, yet confident in them, fully, unconditionally loving, a very present, I am with you. Vulnerably unapologetic in his radical love for me and others. Powerful, mysterious, yet constant. Simply who he is. I am who I am. There are so many things that religion and systems and society have portrayed as Jesus. And, and I don't claim to have some special connection available to me and not others. But what I have found is that if you simply sit with him in the silence. If you come as you really are, not as you think you should be and you just let him love you, you will find rest for your weary soul. You will get to know Jesus as he is, not as a rule-obsessed, record-keeping, fun-hating, cheesy dictator, but a freedom-giving, fully present, completely understanding, wholly forgiving, and unconditionally loving friend who has no intention or desire of leaving you, even when it's messy, maybe especially then. He is Emmanuel, God with us. You know, when we think about the presence of God and the comfort of God, what are we really getting at? We're really getting at the love of God. For a God to be present with us, for a God to be a God who seeks to comfort us, even in the deep valleys of darkness, must be a God who loves us. More than we could ever imagine, actually. And that's why I want us to end this time before we sing one last song by reminding ourselves what Paul wrote through the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 of God's love. I want us to stand and I want us to read Romans 8, 35 through 37 together. We'll read it aloud together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, 
not anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise be to God. Father, we worship you, exalt you, thank you, and glorify you that you are the God of all comfort. You are the God who is with us. You are Emmanuel. You are the one who reminds us that in every circumstance of life, you are our good shepherd who walks with us every step of the way, who comforts us all along the way, and who reminds us that you will never leave us and that you love us. And even now, O oh Lord, as we sing this song, we're reminded that there's no way, there's absolutely no way that we could walk with you and trust you if it weren't for Christ in us. Yet not I, but Christ in me, to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.